Welcome back to We Watch Dead People. Hello. I'm Emma. <laughs> I'm Will. Yeah. This is episode four. Wow. Wow. And we've actually shared some other ones now, so people I know. have maybe listened to them. A handful of people yeah, have listened. Are, thank you. That's nice. Yeah, it thanks, is. Mom. Thank you. And your mom. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, parents. Yeah, it's nice. Um, we are fresh from a viewing of... The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yes, it's one of my favorite uh, horror movies ever. <sighs> oh boy. It was also, I put out a call for recommendations on Instagram and mm-hmm. um, and we got a whole bunch, so hopefully we'll work our way through some of those. But Yeah, thank uh, you guys. But I believe your friend Alex suggested My to. friend Alex. Yeah. My bean. Yeah, that's right. Thanks, Alex. I hated it. <laughs> well, that's your mistake. I did okay. <laughs> we'll get into it in a second. Can I do housekeeping? Because I think you did it for us. I can't remember, but yeah, sure. You did. Okay. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Um, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a uh, horror film, duh, from 1974. It was directed by Toby Hooper, mm-hmm. and it stars Marilyn Burns, Paul A. Partain, Edwin Neal, Jim Sido, and Gunnar Hansen. Gunnar Hansen is the one who's... Leatherface, right? That's correct. Oh, spooky. <laughs> yeah, he's he's a very uncomfortable villain. There's, I think, more so than other... Well, so a lot of people give Halloween credit as like the first Golden Age slasher movie. Mm-hmm. Some people say it's Psycho, you know. But in between, we have Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And uh, Leatherface is probably one of the most complex characters like horror movie villains most of them are very singularly driven and i guess he is too but yeah yeah but like the thing he does with all the different masks and the characters that he's playing within a character are very interesting and i I think that's really that sort of betrays the fact that this movie can come off as like an exploitation movie and kind of just murderous and dumb but i think there's actually a lot more going on in it than people give it credit for and um that's a big reason why it's endured so much well i mean where i will give it credit is the artistry of just the cinematography like there were some beautiful shots and i don't know if beautiful is the right word well crafted shots well there there are some like eerily pretty shots in that movie I, I told you as we watched, there's this one shot where um, one of the... Pam. Of the, Pam, yes. The girl in the red R. shorts. R.I.P. Yeah, she gets up off this like swing outside and walks toward the house. And there's this low shot that tracks behind her as she walks up to the house. And with the blue sky and her red shorts in the white house, all those colors contrasting really hard off of one another in the silky smooth move of the camera. It's really good. It's just a great shot. Oh yeah, well and what you you did tell me I didn't confirm I didn't look it up, but you said it's a low budget. Yeah. Like yeah. like eighty thousand dollars or something at wow. the time. Which I think adjusted for inflation would be like you know, like half a million dollars now, which is not a lot of movie for money for making a movie. Um I guess I don't really know. I think most indie movies now are at least, you know, a couple million dollars that you see like on the art art movies circuit oh all right i've heard of it but yeah i mean they really shoestrung this one together and um they it led to a lot of really uh we talked about this with the exorcist um which was more uh, like the director was really harsh (laughs) um but the exorcist that was more a choice with texas chainsaw massacre toby Hooper, hooper was harsh and uh Harsh, like people got hurt? Yeah. Oh. (laughs) Well, like... Oh, man. The only person, famously, uh, the only person who you actually see a chainsaw make contact with, it's implied in one scene where he kills Franklin, the man in the wheelchair. The only time you actually see it make contact with somebody is Leatherface drops it on his own. And on his leg at the end. We just saw that. That's correct, but... What they did, that was a real chainsaw, and what they did was they had a piece of steak, like, 
attached to a metal plate that they put on his leg. Cooked snake? I, no. I doubt it. No, yeah. But the chainsaw ran through it so fast that it started to heat up, like, hit the metal, and it started to heat up against Gunnar Hansen's leg, and it burned him. Also, whenever <laughs> I think... I think the scene where he kills Franklin in the wheelchair, mm-hmm. he stood... He Gunnar Hansen told that actor not to move and got the chainsaw within six inches of his face running... Because they couldn't have a prop chainsaw. So Why couldn't they take the chain off? No way. I believe we also... would have seen it. The, when... I'm just going to continue to spout facts at you. Fine. The, the scene where Marilyn Burns, Sally, in the movie, has her finger cut at the dining room table. Yeah. That's real. Because they couldn't get it to look right fake. So they actually, she actually said, just cut my hand. And so they did that. Well, that's with permission. I, that's... And, then, and then all the... All the rotting food and like animal bones that are strewn about the Sawyer house in the movie are all real. Oh. So like in the Texas heat in the summertime with like shooting for hours a day with rotting food and stuff around, it apparently made people like very uncomfortable and ill and uh understandably. I think they said they said mul- many actors from the movie have said that they wanted to like I, at least a few of them said they wanted to fight Toby Hooper <laughs> during the making of the movie, but I guess it all worked out for them. So. I mean, it, yeah, if it really became a classic, <laughs> yeah. you got to suffer for real art. That's I guess right. is the message there. That's right. A I mean, you can message. still you can still tell that it's like basically made by some a gr- like a ragtag band of film kids who, from the oh, University yeah. well, of Texas. But what did I joke to you while we were watching that the these rude teenagers had stumbled upon an art collective just trying to do their job. <laughs> yeah, well, yes. But <laughs> I think that could be a metaphor for the whole movie. <laughs> <laughs> I like the introduction, the narration by John Lacret or Lacaret, or how, I, I don't know how to pronounce his name. I don't know. He's in Stripes, he's in some other things. Um, apparently they paid him to do the narration by giving him a joint. That's, that's it. Those are all your facts? Yeah, that's, well, that's at least a few of them. Well, <laughs> but I, I, why didn't you like this one? Oh, I just. Or did you did you actually like it? But it was just scary. Um, I can't decide because I am scared. Like The Exorcist, I really wasn't as scared. Like oh, we don't have to go back to The Exorcist, but you know there I'll were have to like relitigate that. Yeah, there was. Well, you seem to be See, more scared by gory stuff or even the implication of gory. I really because this movie is not as gory as people imagine it would be, but. Still, I mean, no, people are getting a, yeah, like, butchered from an early I, point. Yeah, I don't like the butchering of yeah. bodies. Yeah, okay, well, that's, yeah, this uh, might not be the one for you. Then. That, Yeah, that's a big one for me. And I didn't think it was a bad movie overall, but it was the first one that we've watched for this podcast that, like, not to be graphic here, but my feet were so sweaty. <laughs> I was so nervous during the whole thing. And what's the? Well, I know it's you don't not like... even the first scene with Leatherface, but when he like comes out of the brush at Franklin, the the brother in the wheelchair, and Franklin is the one holding the yeah, flashlight. He's already so killed. Th- sudden... He's already killed three people. At oh that yeah, point, yeah, yeah. But he's like, it seemed almost kind of quick, but it was just it was dark, and then he was in the light of the flashlight, hacking him up, and yeah. I actually was like, ah. Yeah, I think that was the most scared you seemed during the whole movie. Yeah, I did not like that. I I think that the movie really, um, it does thrive on the implied, which is probably... That's a- right. That's why I agreed to watch this, because you've given me this speech three times. Go ahead. I know you've been <laughs> waiting for it. I'm here for you, babe. Go. Okay. Jeez. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> well, everyone thinks it's very gory. They assume, based on the title or the reputation of the movie or the reputation of its sequels which are significantly more there are sequels there are a lot of sequels oh um the second one is actually more of a comedy which is kind of strange um but that's neither here nor there the first movie is everyone thinks it's going to be super gory and it's not as i said only one on-screen chainsaw to body like contact is made in the whole movie that you see um, the leg, yeah. Yeah, other stuff is just heavily implied. You never see people get hit with hammers, but you don't see the contact. You just see the body on the ground. Um, famously, Pam, Pam's character is put on a meat hook early on in the movie. Poor Pam. And in a documentary I watched about this, you know, uh, I think Gunnar Hansen was saying that people talk to him about how gross it is to see the hook go through her. And he always laughs because you don't see that. 
you see her, mm. her like you see her re like put her body up to the hook and then it tights in on her face and she screams but you never actually see her go on the hook. Yes, so, and you had told me that, so I specifically made sure I was not covering my face during that part. Because yeah. I was like, I know there's no hook through the body, because Will said so. Yeah, so I, this this movie really does... Uh, it, it, it It's working on implied stuff rather than graphic stuff. And I honestly think that that's its strong suit. It, it It's... I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't know how quickly to go into are... my, my theories about the movie, but... Go ahead. I just think when things are implied or people believe that they've seen that happen where where they actually haven't, like with the meat hook, it's just an, a testament to the world world building. And I don't mean the actual Texas farm, whatever, that kind of world building. I mean the world yeah. world building of the film with the tenseness and where you, th- you, you're seeing all these bones and feathers and ugh, meat throughout the house that you just expect that you're going to see something terrible. Yeah, well, and it's just a showcase. In, it's like a sensory... It's largely a sensory experience because, like, in the the movie's, like, 85 minutes long. Yeah, it long. felt quick. It's, it's not... It's less than 90 minutes, and most of the people who die in the movie die within, like, the first half an hour. Yes, and so, because... What? We stopped right after Franklin was getting had gotten chopped Mm -hmm. because you had to use the bathroom when you came back i was like how far are we through the movie because all of them are dead except for sally yeah and so the last she's using all her adrenaline screaming so she's not gonna last long that's what i was going to say before you brought up me having to go to the bathroom is that focused in on that not me is that the last half of the movie is basically just sally sally screaming oh my goodness and that makes people really uncomfortable there was like a an academic study done about the movie where they showed it to a bunch of people uh, men and women to see how what they thought about it and how, like gauge their reactions to different scenes and I, I remember that there was one quote in it where a man said that her screaming was the freakiest thing he had ever seen it just, just it just goes screaming so much yeah i mean it just is continuous throughout the last half of the movie and that makes the ending that much more perfect when it seamlessly fades into her laughing, laughing. maniacally yeah, in the I back of like, the truck. Oh it's, my gosh, she's gone which, nuts. Which is probably one of the most memorable horror movie endings, period. I can't think of one that is quite so stuck in my mind as her covered in blood in that symmetrical shot in the truck with Leatherface angrily waving the chainsaw around with the sun coming up. It's like It's incredible looking. Yeah. It, yes. Yeah. It was uncomfortable to watch her scream so much. And maybe it's because I'm sick right now and just my throat hurt listening to her scream that much. And at parts, it, it felt a little hokey to me. It felt a little hokey to me. But I think mainly because I went to theater school. Ugh. And, okay. And <laughs> I did a... I was part of a read through that was a play that was like making fun of like slasher screamo films. Mm -hmm. And it did just have a girl that like screamed the whole time, but it was kind of for laughs. And that's what I was thinking of. Well, I think that's one of the things that watching a movie like this for the first time in 2019 is hard to sort of um, compartmentalize is that movies like this one and Halloween and so on and so forth have become so ubiquitous in pop culture that they're often imitated and have become kind of like stereotypes of movies. Yeah. But when they come out and where they actually sit in the chronology of horror movies, this was like pretty pretty out there. <laughs> um, For the time? Yeah. Uh, and I think, I think it's out there in terms of subject matter, but I think it also, as I said before, resonates because it has a lot of really interesting... Um, thematic stuff that's going on beneath the surface like early on in the movie they establish that there's this slaughterhouse that the kids are like driving by and when they pick up the hitchhiker that he talks about how they they've gotten these like more modernized tools no franklin brought that up yeah but then they talk about it with the hitchhiker i know i know i'm just and the hitchhiker and the hitchhiker doesn't like them no i know modernized tools to slaughter the animals is because his family is a bunch of... They were butchers, and the modernization of the technology has left them isolated Jobless. isolated and crazy. Well, he said... Really, it says... He says that 
oh, the hitchhiker says that they've lost their jobs. Like it took a lot of people out of work, which is why it was no good. Yeah. So, you know, there's there's one commentary that like the industrialization of of these rural communities leaving people to their own devices and going nuts sort of just turned up to 12. Then you have to think about oh, the movie. Yeah. The movie comes out of the wake of things like Vietnam and Watergate and there's like these institutional forces that are making people like question the very fabric and upon which they live and so the movie really taps into that kind of discontent and fear i think that this movie's actually got an awful lot going on underneath this just insane story about a family which also just to continue <laughs> uh-huh. that whole last scene at the dinner table the famous the famous famous dining <laughs> Uh, famous, uh, famous, anus. Jesus, <laughs> the famous, oh, famous, yeah. it's famous, famous dining room scene is pretty much uh, a satire of like American sitcoms. You got the the bread making dad who works at the gas station, the rebellious teen son, and Leatherface playing the mom the housewife kind of character with the with the makeup on his face and everything and that that's they're laughing like insane people and uh talking kind of like a lot a laugh track yeah and arguing about their their house roles and their their position in it it's really weird and i (laughs) I think and it's... they got a sack of dust in the corner, a.k.a. Grandpa. Yeah. <laughs> and that was another thing that actually truly scared me, was the sucking of the blood on the fingers. I was like, why are they forcing her blood onto this corpse? I thought they were going to wipe the blood on his face, like a little <laughs> whisper motion or something. So that's where I was like gearing up for it. I was like, oh, gross, terrible. And then he takes it and sucks on it like a baby with a bottle. And I was like, this is worse. <laughs> but I think that's... His again, little feet kicking. That's why I think the sequel that is more comedy actually is sort of a natural extension of this movie because in a less uh, in a less obvious way than something like, um, just to reference what we've talked about last week, like the Jordan Peele movies, mm-hmm. this movie does play a lot with the line between horror and comedy. Because um, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. there's no way that that presentation of everything with the grandpa is just unconsciously funny. They definitely kind of made it funny, but in a way that is deeply, disturbing. deeply uncomfortable. You're like, oh, like I like, should not be laughing at this m- old man how did he get to be the way he is this is awful but also it's an old man sucking on a bloody finger and like rattling his fists like an infant it is funny and leather but it's not leatherface similarly just because of how he's presented also can make you laugh sometimes but he did not make me laugh I i think he can sometimes but that's also purely out of discomfort because he's clearly not well and disturbing. <laughs> disturbing in such a way that I I didn't really see him as funny. It, especially the makeup, which maybe was supposed to be Maybe funny wasn't what the right word. To. Funny might not be the right word. But, but he it, toes a line. Well, I think I catch myself laughing sort of out of discomfort when he shows oh, up in the makeup. I did with the the hitchhiker brother. Mm-hmm. That's what they referred well, to as character. Early right on, in yeah. The, yeah, like just the... Ooh, the, uh, you don't know quite what's up with him, but it feels wrong and no good. But I will say, I think this movie does set that tone of uncomfortableness early before we even meet the people, the family. When they go to the graveyard and there's that drunk guy rolling around on the on the ground or whatever. Mm-hmm. And the, the guy who like takes sally to go view her grandpa's grave or whatever and he takes her really roughly by the arm i mean maybe that just stood out to me because i'm a lady and i was like oh i would not like to be grabbed like that but he really he's kind of rough with her do you know what part i'm talking about yeah he's like come on all and it seems like he's almost kind of like giggling to his friends and then the drunk guy is there giggling and i was like oh this is a lot of terrible masculinity well and i think that horrible energy i think that a lot of there's been a lot of commentary about, um, well, horror movies in general, but this movie in particular and how it treats women. Mm-hmm. I mean, five there are five people, 
five protagonists, three men, two women. The three men are dispatched rather quickly with, like, blows to the head or, you know, like a five-second chainsaw burst for Franklin. Whereas the first woman, Pam, is strung up on a meat hook and then thrown in a freezer and has this much more gratuitous death. And Sally is just tortured for the entire second half of the movie. Mm -hmm. And, And... uh, Sally also would be a prime example of that final girl trope where it's just one last woman who needs to survive the the villains in a horror movie. Yes, the but, the innocence that overcomes her innocence to whatever the final girl trope is, right? It's like yeah. you think she's all sweet, but in the end she has more power than she ever knew. Well, but, but I it, don't think Sally quite fits that, but that is the trope, right? Yeah, yeah. But I don't think she really But yeah, that's that's sort of the difference between her and like Jamie Lee Curtis in Halloween, which is that Jamie Lee Curtis steps up at the end and fights back against Michael Myers. Yeah, she's but a total badass. Actually, to be fair, at the end of that movie, Donald Pleasance comes in and saves Jamie Lee Curtis, so she's not actually oh. totally independent. And in this movie, um, Sally is saved in part by the truck driver who throws his wrench at Leatherface and by whoever is driving the truck that picks her up. So It looked it, like a man, but I didn't get a good look at him. Sally is not afraid to throw herself through a window, though. Well, that's She's true. got a two-window count. That's true. She's capable of protecting herself by running. But, <laughs> Screaming. But in the movie, she's not given any opportunity to actually fight back. Yeah, no. So you could probably dissect that at length. But, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I don't really know much to say beyond that. It's, it's... Yeah, I don't... It, the one... I... It wasn't a bad movie in terms of movies. I just still really don't like horror films. I do not like to be scared. I think the most redeeming quality is when I looked up the director to do the housekeeping bit. Mm -hmm. And I saw that Leatherface is slightly based on Ed Ed Gein, the butcher of Plainfield. Which I I do not like horror, but I love a good serial killer talk. And I, I, I was like, oh, that actually makes sense. Yeah. The bodies and the bones and, and that's sh- and interesting. Making, making things out of making them. Making things out of the bodies. Yeah. So because I mean, you told me that the beginning narration that said it was a true story, you said no. No, it's that not. was lies. Yeah. yeah. It's also, I mean, it's at least the first, I, one of the first popular movies to put that lie at the beginning of the movie the this is a true story yeah lie and it was incredibly effective which is i mean why i guess of, if you were the people... first movie to do it or one of the first movies people would be like oh well, we believe you and in the 70s people can't just like look it up you know on their phone so a lot of people probably left the theater thinking oh shit <laughs> like <laughs> oh, that happened no. <laughs> yeah. yeah which uh would be quite disconcerting to like know that this like inbred family of cannibals was roaming around texas somewhere but it's well presumably they would have been caught that's how they had made the film but that they were roaming at all yeah ever yeah but uh i think i, I think it really does hold up it's it's it is still frightening to watch. Yeah, it's well crafted despite its budget. I think probably it suffers mostly from some actors who are amateurs, but even so, that sort of adds to that line between the horror and comedy sometimes. Um, and that only really comes up in the first half of the movie. By the second half, the characters are so deranged or being psychologically broken. Yes. That you kind of forget, and it just gets yeah, uncomfortable. Yeah, you're not like, mm, that wasn't super believable, because you're like, well, what would I do if I was chained to a chair that was made out of human arms? <laughs> yeah. I would be upset. I think I would be upset, too. Oh my gosh, I would be so upset. I know this is going to stay with me, and I'm going to have a hard time sleeping tonight. Well, I'll be interested. We've sort of very purposely avoided movies that are very gory, and I wonder yes. what you would think of the reboots or sequels to this or any of the other gory are they horror- gory in a way that's like unbelievable though where it's like almost kind of funny i'm thinking like tarantino i can do no. tarantino no no i don't think that they're like that over the top they're over the top compared to this okay where like almost no violence is actually explicitly shown you ha- are it's up to the viewer's imagination to fill in those gaps with well, their own fucked up brain. My imagination is vast and fucked up. Well, that's great to hear. But 
but the sequels definitely sort of uh, they illustrate a little more clearly what's going on with the imagination. Chainsaw. You don't need it. No. No, you don't. Not in these movies. So they're just a little more grim. I I don't know that we'll... This will... We'll, we'll probably do some franchise series episodes. Maybe we'll come back to these. I don't trust that we'll just know. charge through the Texas Chainsaw Massacre series. Episodes 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. How many sequels were there? There are a lot. There are maybe like 6 or 6 to 8 sequels. All with the same family? Never mind. We can, I'll just look it well, up. Well, they recast, you know. Well... But the second one, the second one is, at the if nothing else, well, hopefully we can do the second one at some point. You said it's a comedy. It is. And that's and not people, what this is about. People should look up the poster because the poster is a, a homage to the Breakfast Club. So imagine all the <laughs> all the characters from this movie, the like unhinged <laughs> cannibal family, posed like the Breakfast Club. It is actually incredible. That's hilarious, especially <laughs> because I had the Breakfast Club poster hanging in my dorm freshman year. Yeah, well, just Aren't imagine. Aren't you so glad cannibals. you didn't know me? Yeah, that's <laughs> hilarious. I think the the one thing we didn't talk about about this movie um, doesn't apply to either of us. I've actually never talked to somebody with this lifestyle choice uh, about this movie, but it's apparently a very pro-vegetarian movie. Tob- Toby Hooper actually said that explicitly. Oh, once. yeah. Well, I guess Pam in the beginning is... I didn't think of that, but now that you say it, Pam in the beginning is like, oh, brain cheese. I We shouldn't eat meat, guys. Yeah, and well, in the That's whole... That's my Pam impression. Apparently, a number of people have said publicly that they became vegetarians after making them or after seeing the movie the director said he became a vegetarian while making it Guillermo del Toro said he became a vegetarian after seeing the movie well if you were working on it and all that rotting meat there funny thing actually Alex who suggested it is a vegetarian oh there you go or is she a vegan now I'm sorry either way Alex you do not consume meat products could have had valuable input on this episode. Yeah, honestly. <laughs> but I, I always just thought that that little tidbit was also kind of interesting. No, that is interesting. I still think that the, the as far as like the underlying themes. Commentary. The, yeah, the stuff about why the family went insane is more interesting to me. But um, the, the fall the, of industrialized America. Yeah. Huh. Which is quite interesting. But I still think ultimately... That it's very good. It's very scary. Those sounds, that like weird sharp... I can't even describe to you what that sound is that plays in the beginning of the movie, just like over the snaps. It's like that weird like what? sound. It's just horrible. <laughs> <laughs> it's so It sends a chill up my spine. I have no idea what you're talking about, well, but I support you and your Foley work. It's terrible. It's just very frightening. <laughs> Uh, and I'm just thinking of your chainsaw sound now. <laughs> Do it once for the microphone, Willie. It's so oh, funny. Why? Because <laughs> it's funny, and if you don't do it, I'm going to do it. But no pressure. Run, dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I was trying You're to... You're almost there, um, but it's not quite fast. So like, run, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I was trying to explain it at one point. And so very scary sounds. Yeah. Throughout I've the movie. Did a very good job <laughs> pitching how scary it is, I think. But... <laughs> I I I think it, it definitely I should I getting tripped over my words. I think mm. the exorcist probably Ugh. in my opinion is it holds up and it scares a little bit better. But what? I think Never that, mind, keep going. I think like we the can't... the effects are all they just hold up a little okay. bit better whereas the Texas Chainsaw Massacre does look a little dated in some of its effects sometimes mm-hmm. but the just sort of barrage this barrage of grotesque and gruesome images and sounds for just 80 straight minutes uh really puts this one over the top i mean it is just unrepentantly macabre and terrible <laughs> in I the was, best way yeah i was really scared to see it now I saw it, and it scared me. There you go. It served its role. Ugh. Well, a lot of people wanted us to watch some more gruesome 
uh, horror movies. Well, so. stop suggesting that. Well, you know, we got a couple people asking for the Saw movies and stuff. No, I don't want to see that. I don't well, like... Well, we're going to do it. <laughs> the people want it, Emma. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so, well, but you made it through the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. With so. sweaty feet. That's, that's Sweaty feet aren't the worst thing. It'll oh. be all right. So you toughed it out. Huh. And I, I don't know that anyone learned anything about it here today. But oh, and now we have to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be okay. I promise. You can't promise diddle. What if just in the middle of the night we'll throw quiet? <laughs> 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 that would come from me. Okay, well, that's good. I can do that. No one, no one will is here to keep me safe. <laughs> run da 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 run da 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 that's how they'll keep them away. Thank well, you. Yeah, of course. So, yeah, I don't, I don't, do we have a movie picked out for the next, next one? No, we? but we're going to tease it on our Instagram so you'll know, like, three days ahead of time, if you're a good guesser, what it will be, and you can watch it. Yeah, hopefully we'll have done that for this episode, too, yeah, so I'm you'll kind of know it what up. it is, but, uh, what we're talking about, but we'll do it for the next one, too. Yeah. Who knows what it'll so be? So follow us on Instagram if you want. It's Instagram, Twitter. At we watch dead people. Twitter is we watch dead people, but people is spelled P P L because we're with it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're on Facebook too. Yeah, we have uh, a Facebook page. Also, we watch dead people. And uh, as of this taping, we're on Google Play Music, Spotify, mm-hmm. Stitcher, TuneIn, and uh, hopefully. Hopefully soon we'll be on Apple Podcasts too, and then we'll be we'll be on all the heavy hitters. You can listen to wherever you want, or on SoundCloud. Oh yeah, that's so, right. Where we started, yep. so, our humble origins. That's right. So, <laughs> uh, thank you for listening, everyone. This has been We Watch Dead People with Emma and Will. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll talk to you again soon. See you next week. Okay, run da da dun dun dun. Run da da dun dun dun.